I titled my message this morning, Killing the Agagite. And I pray that the Lord will help us to expound on that and that when we leave here this morning, we'll understand who the Agagite is and we'll understand how to kill him. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 15. And um, we're just going to go ahead and read that whole chapter. Amen. Okay. Praise God. All right. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Now let me just stop for one quick second and just explain to you the word hearken. Some people you may know what it means, but really the word hearken doesn't just mean that your auditory function is functioning, if you will. It doesn't just mean that your tympanic membrane is nicely up against your ear ossicle bones and that the sound waves are vibrating and sending the signal to your brain and telling your brain to hear. When in reality what it's talking about is, is that you can hear the, the words, but that you're also obediently submitting to that which is being heard. And so what Samuel is going to Saul to say is, is that the God says, I anointed you to be king. Now you need to hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now, real quick, I want to tell you what that was about. Out of Exodus chapter 17, if you went back and you read that chapter, what you would give out the middle of the chapter is in the time frame whenever Israel is wandering in the wilderness. So just real quick, if we'll, if we'll remember some of our dates, uh, just to give us a little bit of an idea, it was about 1440 or something like 1400, 1440 BC, something like that. We don't have to pay you know, too close attention. This is just a roundabout time. 1440, 1400 BC, whenever the children of Israel exited Egypt. All right, that's why it's called the Exodus. They exited Egypt. And it was about, I'd say, 500 years later, somewhere around there, around 1000 to 950 BC, that God anointed Samuel, I'm sorry, God anointed Saul to be king over Israel. A lot of time, a lot of time passed. A lot of things happened during that time frame to the nation known as Israel. But nevertheless, this is where we are. So back 500 years before, God said, I remember Amalek. They just out of nowhere. I anointed you to be king, Saul. And I remember what Amalek did. They lied in wait. What does that mean? Well, back whenever you were in school, we used to call it sneaking somebody. Somebody would wait for you around the corner when they didn't like you. And whenever you came around the corner, they'd sneak you. They'd hit you when you weren't ready for it. That's what Amalek did to Israel. They <laughs> snuck them. They lied in wait. They hid themselves. They came up from behind them and they attacked them. And, got, and, and if you'll remember the story, that was whenever Aaron and her were up on the mountain with Moses and Joshua was down there with the children of Israel fighting and they had to hold up the arms of Moses and as long because his arms were becoming weak and that means that in the flesh you cannot in your own strength you cannot accomplish the victory for yourself only God can give the victory and Aaron and her you can try to preach that as though you know uh I'll be your friend when you're not strong. Lean on me. You can try to lean on your friend all you want to, but your friend's going to let you down. This is actually representative of the Holy Spirit lifting you up and giving you the yes, strength. And amen. as long as you're putting your hope and trust in the Holy Spirit, in God, the, amen, to give you the victory, then the victory ensues. And every time they hold up his arms, then Israel was receiving victory. By the way, Amalek was a descendant of Esau. Y'all know who Esau is, right? Esau was Jacob's twin brother. Esau's a perfect type of the flesh. Jacob's a perfect, it's supposed to be the promised seed, amen? And, and so we see here the flesh coming against the plan of God, and we see in Exodus 17, God uh, desiring that, the, that Moses' hands be held up, amen, and that whenever the Spirit of God is the one that's bringing the victory in the midst of that battle. I just wanted you to see that. But so now, 500 years later, God has anointed Saul to be king over Israel, and he's saying, I remember Amalek. I remember what they did to the children of Israel. And he said, I want you to do something about it. God doesn't forget. See, God knows, and you know, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but maybe I'll forget to make the point later. God has omniscience and foreknowledge. You know what that means, right? That means he can see into the future. 
He knows the beginning from the end. You and I don't know that. Amen. There's going to be times that there's going to be an Amalek or an Agag. Agag is the king of Amalek in our story today. And if the, God knows what's going to happen in the future. God knows that if you don't allow this situation to be dealt with, it's going to continue to cause problems in your life later. And so God's telling Saul through Samuel the prophet. By the way, Samuel in this story, in my mind, he represents the Holy Spirit. We'll get into that a little bit more. Why? Because he's speaking. He represents the Spirit of God versus Saul, once again, as a type of the flesh. You know what, the, you know what a type of the flesh means, right? The, the, the flesh can be described as either something that we just want. Come on, somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about this morning? Does anybody, I know y'all are quiet. That's probably because y'all are thinking. Either that or y'all are trying to ignore me. Don't try to ignore me when the preacher's preaching. That's not cool. Just so you stay home if you're going to ignore me. What I'm trying to say is this. Is that the flesh is something that we want. The spirit is what God wants. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, yeah. A, don't, don't think that the Christian can't walk in the flesh. Almost the majority of the New Testament or Paul's writing is talking about a struggle that ensues between the flesh and the spirit. What God the Holy Spirit is describing to us is his will for our lives. And what our flesh, what our desires are that we want that fights and battles against what God wants in the midst of our lives. Yes. Amen. And so what I need you to understand is, is that Samuel, as the mouthpiece of God, as the prophet of God, is representing the Holy Spirit. He speaks forth the truth of God. In the New Testament, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Amen? And at the same time, Saul represents the flesh. Even from his beginning, we've talked about this before. After the time frame of the judges in this period between here, there was a time frame called the judges at the end of the judges. The people of God said, give us a king because we want to be like the other nations around us. Amen. See, Saul was a choice of the people, not the choice of God. Amen. God's choice was David. A young boy that he had prepared. I can prove it to you from the scriptures. I don't, I don't know what your, your other preacher told you, but Saul was never going to be the choice of God. Right. It, Saul would be, it, because before Saul ever was, Genesis 49.10, says that the scepter, talking about the king's staff, will not depart from Judah, talking about the tribe from which Messiah would come, which was Jesus, which came from G Jesus and, G and David, both came from the tribe of Judah. Okay, The scepter the king's staff will not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. The word Shiloh means to the one to whom it belongs. Ultimately, we understand that the scepter is in the hands of Jesus and that one day he's going to rule and reign in Jerusalem Amen. for a thousand years. Amen. Amen. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that Genesis 49.10 was long before Israel ever cried out for a king named Saul. Israel wanted what they wanted. That's very important for our message this morning. Israel wanted what they wanted. God said, I'm going to give you what you want, but it's not my will and Saul from that point moving forward is always a type of the flesh and in this story this morning Samuel is a type of the spirit what God wants rather than what flesh wants. Amen? Yeah. Alright. Verse 3. Now this is what God wants him to do. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling ox and sheep camel and ass. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Tilium, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good. And would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Just before we move on, isn't that something? He didn't want to kill the good stuff. He wanted to just kill the nasty stuff. You know? And so you can just kind of, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let's just make that point. He, didn't, he wanted to hold on to the good stuff. And he, wasn't, he, wasn't, he didn't have a problem at all with killing the nasty stuff that he didn't like. 
It says in verse 10, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. Now, Sandy, is there any way that you can actually, do we have different versions of the Bible on that thing? Do we have the ESV version on there? No? Okay, well then never mind. Let me just tell you, the, yeah, now, the, you know good and well, I've already explained to y'all why we use the King James Bible. Not because somebody else told us to. But because we believe that the manuscripts that the King James Bible is written from are the right manuscripts. I don't have time to get into all the details. If I've told many of you about this, the two-part series, A Lamp in the Dark, Part 1 and Part 2. It's six hours if you're interested in really knowing what I believe to be the truth about the Bible and what God desires to speak, at least to English-speaking people, then you can watch that series. Amen. The reason I was going to ask her, I don't endorse the ESV. But the ESV is a literal translation from different manuscripts. That's why I don't like the ESV. But it is a literal translation. And in many places, those other manuscripts have the majority of the right stuff in there. And the main reason I wanted to use the ESV, and I can just tell you about it, is that right here in verse 12, it says, Meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place. In the King James Version, it says, he set him up a place. In the ESV Version, it says, he set himself up a monument. So and what he did was he create, he had a monument made that represented him. So in the midst of all of this story, whenever Saul is taking it upon himself to do what it is that he wants rather than what God wants, he's feeling pretty good about himself. You kind of see the motives of Saul's heart behind the whole thing. The motives of his heart is, is that he wants to be exalted. He wants to be seen. He wants to receive some glory rather than really wanting to be obedient to God and rather than really exalting God. Does that make sense? And that's what I wanted you to see there. All right. Verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said unto him, blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel, no, you didn't. <laughs> and Samuel said, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? You're saying that you, would, you obeyed the commandment of the Lord, but I hear sheep bleeding and I hear cattle lowing. I can hear it, Saul. What are you talking about? I'm the one. I'm the represented in this story as the spirit of God. The voice of God has spoken to you, told you what to do. And now you're going to sit here and you're going to say you obeyed the commandment of the Lord when the reality of it is, is that there's still cattle and that there's still sheep. And he says, verse 16, verse 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from, from the Amalekites. So what Samuel's question was, what is the sound of this bleeding of sheep and lowing of oxen, which I hear? And Saul's response was, they, see that, that plural pronoun, they did it. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. First off, I think he's lying. I don't think that he planned on saving the good animals, to, that he had a, in his heart the motives. I mean, I can't prove it, but I mean, looks like to me, he's setting up monuments for himself. He's disobeying the word of the Lord. To me, he saw the cattle and the, the, the sheep and the oxen, and it looked good, and he wanted to hold on to it. But now he's busted in the situation, and it's like he's going to blame somebody else for it. They did it. Then it says in verse 16, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has to, to, said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then, didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil? 
and did evil in the sight of the Lord. In other words, you didn't obey God. Instead, what you did was you flew upon the good stuff, the spoil. That's what it means. Whenever you take something in war, the stuff that's left over. People, one of the, I'm not going to say who, but one of the candidates right now saying, wouldn't worry, you want to go to the Middle East war and destroy all the people. You should have took the oil. The oil would be considered the spoil. Whenever you destroy a country, at least back in those days, you didn't do it for nothing. If you were going to go to war and you were going to utterly destroy them, them, you took their stuff. And there was nothing wrong with that, but in this situation, God said, I want you to utterly destroy everything that they have. And it says right here, uh, verse 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And he didn't kill, let's make something clear, I mean, in case I forget later. He, that's not even true. I mean, yeah, he saved Agag, but there are obviously other Amalekites left because in the end he's killed by the Amalekites. So he might have killed all the ones that were right there, but he only went so far. I think the place they said was sure, and he should have went further until he utterly destroyed all of them. But it seems like, and I'm having to read through, the, the, sometimes the scriptures are silent, but you have to go back and you have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. If in the end Saul was killed by the Amalekites, it means he didn't utterly destroy all of them that existed. But rather he destroyed the ones that were in the midst of that skirmish. And like Samuel said, you flew upon the spoil. You got distracted from the word of the Lord. You saw these things that your flesh wanted and you stayed right here and you focused on this instead of focusing on what the Lord commanded you to do. And he goes on to say right here, uh, but the verse 21, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. That's Saul again blaming the people. And Saul said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings? Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? This is important. As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, not just to listen, but to submit than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Pretty serious. But Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Blame it on the people again, Saul. <laughs> Now, therefore, I pray that you pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and it rent. In other words, it was ripped. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. He was talking about David. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Talking about God. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. So for some reason, Samuel changed his mind and did worship with him. But then it says, then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. In other words, enough time has gone by. Surely you don't plan to, 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 to kill me. It says in verse 33, and Samuel said, as thy sword has made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. The word hewed means he hacked him into pieces. There was pieces of Agag all over the ground. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So as we said early on, at least in some of the time that I was reading in the story, and for the purposes of the story this morning, the idea that I feel like that the Lord has put on my heart is that the characters of the story, they always in a narrative, 
give us an idea of what God's trying, what desires to communicate to us. And so in this particular situation, Samuel is representative of the Spirit of God because he's the voice of God speaking to the people of God. He desires to speak to King, the King who's the leader of the people, that his will would be done. And so, but Saul is a type of the flesh. And that one of the things that I want you to understand is this, is that there's going to be times in your life that God is going to show you and desire to kill Agag in your life. There's going to be times uh, in the season of your journey of Christianity that you're going to come to the realization that God wants to kill Agag in your life. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who is Agag? Is Agag that person that I can never get along with? Like that person that I'm always constantly getting in a fight with? Is that who Agag is? Is that who God wants to kill in my life? Not to say that God wants to kill the person physically, but maybe God wants to sever this relationship. So I would think that's what God wants to do. He just wants to sever this relationship. He wants to kill this person that I have in the midst of my life, or at least he wants to kill this relationship that I have. Is, is Agag the boss, the tenth boss that, that you couldn't get along with? In other words, the, the first nine were in Agag too. And God kept getting rid of them. But this number 10, but no, 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 no. Agag isn't the boss that you can't get along with. And he's not the people on the job that you can't get along with. That's not who Agag is. Is, is Agag the person that, um, that you hung out with and whenever you were hanging out with them, you fell back into the mess that you used to fall into. You know, whatever it may be, whether it be drinking, whether it be doing drugs, whether it be getting into a sexual relationship. No, that's not the case. Agag isn't the person that you fell into the mess with. The reality of it is, is that Agag is a spiritual stronghold in your life. And you need to start recognizing the fact that the problems that we encounter are spiritual problems. There's things that are taking place in the spiritual realm, and we, can, we tend to only see things in the physical realm. And the reality of it is, is that when you see repetitive problems that are taking place time and again in your life, you need to understand that there is a spiritual reasoning behind it, and that everything is not going to be fixed through what the psychologist says, everything's not going to be fixed through what the counselor says, through what the program says, but the reality of it is, it's going to take a movement and an operation of the Holy Spirit to kill Agag. So there's a couple of things that I want you to know this morning whenever the Lord reveals to you that Agag needs to die in your life. Number one, your heart's going to have to want what God wants. In order for Agag to die, your heart is going to have to want what God wants. Number two, you're going to have to obey the word of the Lord. Amen? And number three, you will have to let the spirit kill Agag because the flesh never will. I say, let me say that again. You're going to have to let the spirit, Samuel, in this story, kill Agag because the flesh, Saul, never will. Your flesh is never going to let Agag die. Amen? All right. When it's, so one of the things, once again, going back to Hebrews chapter 12, if you could turn with me there. So Agag, <clears throat> to just say it another way, represents something in our life, amen, that, that continues to repetitively reveal itself in our lives, continues to rear its ugly head, and causes problems in our walk with God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And 2. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You know, the, the word weight there, literally, I mean, I don't have to define sin, I don't think, but the word weight literally is describing an, an encumbrance. It's, it's describing weight. Could you imagine, have you ever seen people running down the road and they got those vests on? They have weighted vests nowadays. As though running wasn't good enough by itself. They have weighted vests and they wear a vest to run so that whenever they run in a race, they, they, they're trained even harder and so therefore theoretically they can run even faster. It'd be almost like if you put the weight on, the weighted vest, when you were trying to run the race. So what the author of Hebrews is trying to let us know is this, is that there's a race that we're running, amen? And the race that we're running, he's talking about your journey of Christianity because he said, look, your journey as a child of God... 
such a great cloud of witnesses has gone before us. He's referring back to chapter 11. He's talking about Moses. He's talking about Abraham. He's talking about all these mighty fathers of the faith that went for some of them were sawn asunder. The church tradition tells us that Isaiah was sawn in half by a sword because he refused to shrink back from the truth of God and the things of God. And some of them were, were killed in various ways. And so the author of Hebrews says, look at this great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. You and I have a race to run. I mean, if we're truly the children of God and we truly desire to serve God, then we need to understand that we're in the midst of a race. Amen. And that we're here to finish the race. And sometimes there's weights in our life and there's sin in our lives that beset us and get us off track. What I'm trying to tell you this morning is that Agag represents those weights and represents those sins in the midst of our life. But it says in verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I got to tell you that Jesus, he saw the joy that was set before him. You know what the joy that was set before Jesus was? Knowing that in his obedience to the father, he was going to redeem you. He was going to redeem you from the sinful life that you were born into of Adam. And he was going to buy you out of the slave market of sin. And that he was going to give you a new hope, a new beginning, and a new life to serve him free from the bondage of weight. Free from the bondage of sin that continues to so easily beset you from running the race. Now in the modern church, we've got a problem. We got a problem because everybody believes that God's in the business of just making their life here on earth better. And the reality of it is that we got people that are best selling authors. And they say, your best life now. Well, you might want to go back and you might want to go talk to Isaiah who was sawn in half. And, and talk to him and see whether or not he likes your theology. You might want to talk about the other ones that died brutal deaths. Some of the word of faith people say you just didn't have enough faith, dude. If you would have had enough faith, you'd have been driving Rolls Royce and wearing a $500 suit instead of getting your belly sawn in half. And then, but no, that's not true. See, we're not looking for a crown upon this earth. We're looking to the author and the finish of our faith. We understand that he went before us. And we understand that there's an eternity to grab a hold of. And that there's a present day right now that's trying to get in the way of what God desires to do in the midst of our lives. And we to understand that Agag stands in the way and that there's going to be times in your life that God desires to reveal to you that Agag has to die. Amen. Amen. So, number one, you're going to have to want what God wants in your life in order for Agag to die. If not, he'll just stay alive. He might not, that sometimes in your life he might not be as obvious. He might not be as vocal, but he'll still be there. And But you're going to have to want what God wants in order for him to die. And when you want what God wants, you're going to quit looking for other people to blame whenever that things are going wrong and you realize that God is dealing with you. I don't know that we have to go back and look specifically, but, you know, I made a pretty good point, but we can go back. First Samuel 15, 21, it says, but the people took of the spoil of the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord God. In Gilgal. And then in verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. So here we see again, I know I made the point already, but Saul is blaming other people. Yeah. When the reality of it is, is that it's his flesh. He's the flesh. And he's holding on to what it is that he wants to hold on to. He's like, and this is oftentimes what we do. We'll do this in our own lives many times. That when we continue in sin and we begin to feel bad about it later, but we're really not ready for Agag to die. You understand what I'm getting at? There's yes, a difference yes. between guilt and repentance. Yes. I know because I've felt them both. There's a difference between guilt and repentance. 
And whenever we find ourselves in the midst of a situation where we're continuing to sin, and, and we, but we do, we feel bad about it. We feel, I'm not saying you don't love God. I'm not saying I don't love God. We feel bad about it. We're not happy about it. But we're really not ready for Agag to die. We start blaming other people. We start looking around and want to blame. But whenever you're really ready for Agag to die, you quit blaming other people and you start looking at your own self and you start having a desire to want what God wants in the midst of your life. Amen? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just wrote down a few things. If she just wouldn't have been so beautiful, I wouldn't have lusted after her that way. No, it wasn't her beauty that did it. It was Agag was still alive in the midst of your life. The spiritual condition, you weren't dead to this problem yet. If those people I was with wouldn't have had those drugs and asked me to do drugs with them, I just wouldn't have done drugs. No, that's a lie. Amen. It wasn't the people's fault. Amen. You still Amen. love drugs. Amen. You still like to get high. And so therefore you allowed yourself to be around people that had drugs and you did drugs. Agag was still alive yes. in the midst yes. of your life. You need yes. to quit blaming everybody else as though it's everybody else's right. fault. And you need to start looking at your own self and realize yes. that Agag isn't die, dead yes. and that he still wants some life. And you got to come to the realization, no Lord, I want what you want and I'm ready for you to kill this Agag. In the midst of that life, Amen. in the midst of my life. If that woman wouldn't have made me bad, I wouldn't have talked about her. No, that's a lie. You like to talk about people. <laughs> the reality of it is, is that for so don't ask me why, because I've been guilty of it just like the rest of you. For some reason, we like to talk about people behind their back. Why do we do that? Does it make us feel good? Like that? I wrote this stuff down yesterday, buddy. That didn't listen to me. We still like to talk about people. Sometimes people can find things in the midst of our lives. They can find things and they, they tell us about things. And then we turn around and we go tell somebody else about it. What's going on with us? Lord, help us. Yeah. There's something that's a juicy little morsel. The proverb yeah. talks about that. And for some reason, we like to tell people about other people's business. No, the reality of it is, is that it's an agag yeah. in your life. The Lord doesn't like it. And he wants to kill it. Amen. And that person Amen. would have done what they were supposed to. I wouldn't have gotten so mad. No, that's not the case. The problem is, is that you still have an anger issue. Anger is an agag in your life. Yes. And every single time the wrong thing hits you the wrong way, you blow up Amen. and you act a fool. And the Lord's been trying to deal with this spiritual stronghold in the midst of your life, all of your life. And there's been times in your life that you've done a little bit better. And there's been times in your life that you've done a little bit worse. But the reality of it is, is that agag is still alive. And you're going to have to want what God wants. And listen to me, friends. Church, loved ones, the reality of it is, is that until Agag dies, there's going to be another lust, there's going to be another drug, yes. there's going to be another gossip, and there's going to be another anger. Until the Lord kills Agag, it's going to keep resurfacing. The second thing I want you to know about you're going to have to want to do what God wants is this. Saul didn't want what God wanted. That's just the reality. Saul, the type of the flesh... Did not want what God wanted. The reality of it is, is this, is that he saw them sheep and they were fat. The Amalekites had some fat sheep. They may not mean a whole lot to you and me, but to people back then that herded sheep, fat sheep was good sheep. Had nice and plump and full of meat. And, and, they, and, and he wanted them sheep. And, and not only that, the idea of holding on to Agag and parading him around, look at this, guys. The Lord anointed me to be king. I'm head and shoulders above everybody else in the camp. And look, I got Agag, the king of the Amalekites. It's pretty obvious that God made the right choice whenever he appointed me and anointed me to be the king of Israel. See, the reality of it is, is that the reason that you have to want what God wants in order for God to kill Agag in the midst of your life is because this is a spiritual battle. This isn't something that you see. You got to dig deep on the inside to be able to even come to the realization that what I'm trying to tell you is real. The reality of it is, is that sometimes stuff looks good. Sometimes Sometimes stuff feels good and it makes us feel good. And that's why the flesh, until the flesh saw, he ain't never, the flesh is never going to want Agag to die because the flesh is more concerned and consumed about itself feeling good rather than doing what God wants and listening unto the voice 
of the Lord. Amen. So I wanted you to know that you're going to have to want what God wants. Amen? Amen. You're going to have to quit blaming other people. And you're also right. going to have to come to the conclusion that what you see, what makes your flesh feel good, is not really what God wants. Amen? And, and, and ain't nobody else going to be able to convince you of that. I mean, the priest, I know sometimes people make fun because I got a vein that pops out on my forehead. And even if I make the vein pop out on my forehead and I cause the veins <laughs> in my neck to pop out and get my face red and I start screaming and spitting Amen. all over the place, that's not going to do, that's not going to convince you Amen. to come to the place. Yeah. It's not going to convince me. I, I just should put a mirror up here and preach to myself. It's not going to convince me. It's going to be the Holy Spirit bringing us through Amen. the trials of life. Yes. Come on, somebody. The journey of God. I'm not preaching to you from a judgment perspective as though I got it all figured out. I'm not preaching to you as though I've got victory in all them areas of my life. That I don't ever have anger issues. That I don't ever talk about people in the way that I should talk about people. I'm not trying to come at you as that I got it figured out. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Is that it's not another, per another person can try to tell you about it. We can try to preach it hard. But it's going to be the Holy Spirit Amen. through the trial Amen. of life, bringing you on your journey, getting you to the place where you will agree with him yes. that this is what is Amen. best for your yes. life. And Amen. when you begin to want what God wants, he begins to move on your behalf. But you see, you can't play games with God. You understand what I'm saying? You can tell somebody one thing. Come on. Have you ever done that before? Sure you have. You don't even have to raise your hand. You tell somebody who you want to believe what you want them to believe. You tell them what you want them to believe. But the reality of it is, is that the Lord the whole time is over there tinkering with your heart. And he's saying, hey, you tell them the truth, boy. You, you, you got this little hidden thing right here. You can't hide that stuff from God. God knows all. He sees all. He, he, he's right there in the midst of it all. And, and, and he knows whenever you're coming clean with him or you're not. And then you, we want him to move on our behalf. Lord, help us. Amen. It says, Amen. the second thing I need you to know is this. Is that you will have to obey the word of the Lord. You, you're not going to be able to determine on your own what's okay with God and what's not okay with God. God's word speaks and then we must obey that's what the word, the word of the Lord said in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. Uh, whenever, Samuel, whenever Saul blamed it on the people about the sacrifices, the people saved the best sacrifices for the Lord. And, Sam, and this is what Samuel said. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken or to listen and submit than the fat of rams. Now, in the Old Testament sacrifice, the fat of the animal was specifically set aside for God. It was the, poor, the, the choicest portion of the animal that was, that was supposed to be offered up. And it was a sweet smelling aroma into the nostrils of God. And it was representative of the best part of the animal, which God was going to give his best, which was Jesus that was going to die on the cross. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, if you're really, if you're a Bible student and you desire to study the scriptures, the first thing that stuck out in my head and heart when I read this passage of scripture many years ago, after the Lord had opened my eyes is, well, well Lord, you don't care about sacrifice? Your whole redemption plan is built upon sacrifice. Everything that you've done has surrounded sacrifice. Immediately with the disobedience that took place in the garden, you provided a sacrifice when you clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of an animal that had nothing to do with their sin. Everything. So that's not what God's saying. He's not coming against the sacrificial work. No, his whole plan. What he's trying to say is this, is that you can go through the movements of religion. And listen to me, cross hearer, cross listener, cross uh, student of the, of the message of the cross, you and I can do it too. The reality of it is, is that we can know the message of the cross, we can know the message of the finished work of Christ, and we can continue on in disobedience in areas of our life, and the Lord would say the same thing today that he said through Samuel then, to hearken is better than sacrifice, because what he means by that is this, it's not better, there's nothing better than the sacrifice of Jesus, right. but from the worshippers perspective you can sit here Jesus did his work and yeah. now God is is commanding his followers his hearers his believers to submit themselves
themselves to what it is that he's asking of them and for them to follow after his will. As a matter of fact, you don't have to turn there on the computer, but John 20, 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Amen. The voice of the Lord. See, you're going to have to obey the word of the Lord. In the Old Testament times, I said it before, the word of God says that God spoke through the prophets. That's what it says in Hebrews. You can turn there on the computer. Hebrews chapter 1. Chapter verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. What does that mean? It means that in various ways and in various times in the past, in the Old Testament, God spoke to his people through the prophets. Just like he's speaking to King Saul through Samuel. Has in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. I'm trying to make a point here. Mm -hmm. God spoke through Samuel to Saul, but Saul refused to obey the voice of the Lord. If you want Agag to die in your life, you're going to have to obey the voice of the Lord. God doesn't speak the way now he does sometimes still speak through the mouth of the prophet. He'll sometimes speak through your friend. He'll speak through other people. Yeah. But really and truly, the way that God speaks now is he speaks through Jesus. Amen. And then more specifically, the way that he does that, according to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36, you can turn there. Ezekiel chapter 36. It says in Ezekiel 36, verse... 27, he's talking about the new covenant. I know I've shared this with y'all before many times, but let's, let, we can actually go back to verse 25. It says, then, talking about when I bring forth the new covenant, will I sprinkle clean water upon you? Talking about cleansing and being made, made, made cleansed. I've already explained how the blood is connected to the water. We don't have time to get into that. But God's redemption and cleansing doesn't come through the act of water baptism. It comes through the shedding of Jesus' blood and your faith in that. Water baptism is an outward sign of that inward truth that took place. It says, I will clean you from all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. Listen to me. You know how you know whether you're saved or not? Let me tell you how you know whether you're saved or not. Because if there's a change in you to where you're not constantly desiring to do all the things that you used to do. I'm not saying you don't ever still do some stuff. But there's something on the inside of you that's warring with you, that's telling you that it's not okay to continue down that process. Then guess what? That means the Holy Spirit moved in. He took up residence and he's desiring to do something in the midst of your heart. He's trying, he's desiring to do a work in you. He said, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And look at this, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So God's saying in the new covenant, ultimately, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Going back to the Hebrews passage we talked about. God in various ways and in various times spoke to the people through the prophets. But in these last days, he speaks to us through Jesus. And more specifically, the way that he done it, did it was he brought Jesus here to speak the truth, but then to offer his life as a sacrifice. Amen. And then when you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit killed you, the old man that you were born of Adam, buried you in Christ and resurrected you to newness of life. During that process of being saved or born again, the Holy Spirit moved into the midst of your heart, and now he speaks to you. In order, that's point number two. In order for Agag to die, you're going to have to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Now, the next thing I want to point out to you regarding uh, obedience is this. Is that you can't sit here and think for one second that you're just going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to decide to be obedient. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, nope. that's not going to happen. <laughs> Truth of the matter is, you can turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. We're killing Agag this morning, or we're at least desiring to introduce the thought that God definitely wants to kill him in our lives. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Verses 12 through 13. 
It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, we probably ought to stop right there for a second because that's a famous scripture, right? Y'all heard that scripture before? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. We, we, we probably want to just make sure we take a little bit of time with this and, you know, make sure everybody's on board with us at the same, in this process. You know, many times in my walk, at least whenever I first, have you ever talked to anybody and you tried to bring a little correction in their life before? And they're like, well, the scripture says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so you're over here judging me, but God hasn't convicted me of that yet. That's not what the scripture's talking about. Well, there's, there's right and there's wrong. The word of God is clear on what's right and wrong. And, and the reality of it is, is that in the new covenant, if the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, he's speaking to you. He's speaking to you and he's moving you in a certain direction where he wants you to be obedient. And to work out your own salvation doesn't mean this may be wrong for you, but it's okay for me. No, that's not what it's saying. The, you're, listen to me. Grace, I, wrote, I preached a message one time. Grace is for grownups. And what I meant by that was this, is that grace will hold you more accountable than the law ever could. But at the same time, nobody else sees the grace that's moving and speaking to your heart. You understand what I'm getting at? The grace brings communication from God to a whole new level. It's not like Samuel's just standing up right here and confronting you to your face. The Lord says that you're to do this. No, the Holy Spirit's gently speaking to your heart. Amen. Grace is for grownups. So we're talking about the fact that grace is for grownups. And we talk about the fact that God has brought communication in the New Testament to a whole other level. You understand what I'm talking about? God, in, in the past times, spoke through the prophets. Now he speaks through Jesus. And hallelujah, Jesus lives in your heart. Yes. Amen. Praise God. The grace is for grown-ups. I'm speaking to the preacher right now. <laughs> grace is for grown-ups. Why? Because when you catch a kid, don't put your hand in the cookie jar. Right? <laughs> Do not take another cookie out of that cookie jar. And then you come back up in, you know some cookies been missing, and you come back up in that kitchen, and you see that kid right there, and he got his hand up in that cookie jar, and you're like, I thought I told you not to put your, not to take any more cookies out of that cookie jar. And the little, little dude said, what did he say? I ain't taking no cookies out of no cookie jar. And his hand's just right there. See, a child can't under, no, you, can, you need to start teaching a child grace, but that's why you need to have some law up in the midst of your house. But nevertheless, for some reason, we just don't obey the voice of God Amen. the way that we want to. It's just really not that big of a deal. I started this process off with saying you're not going to be able to determine what is right versus what is wrong when the Holy Spirit starts to speak to your heart. And you resist that. When you begin to resist that, it begins to sear your conscience in that area. Amen. It begins to cause you to go and you're willing to go your own way instead of God's way. Amen. And it results in a big old mess. So if you want God to kill Agag, you're going to have to want what he wants. And you're going to have to begin to obey his voice. Now, we were talking about working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That was the point I was trying to make. Whenever you're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, do you understand that there's a hell to shun? I gotta remind myself of this sometimes. Do you understand that there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain? And I understand truthfully that, that it's because we're born again and it's all the work of Jesus and it's the work of the Holy Spirit living in the midst of our lives that, that, that has separated us and redeemed us and made us clean and that it's not the work of ourselves that gets us in. Amen. But at the same time, do you understand that when we play with sin, it will begin to destroy our life and yes, will begin will. to destroy our faith and that yeah. many times we might think yeah. we're okay and the reality of it is, is that we are not okay because yeah. we're living in the midst yeah. of blatant sin and we right. have seared our conscience and and we think we're fine and the reality, no, you're not fine. Yes. And you're on the brink of finding yourself in the midst of destruction yes. and in the midst of a devil's hell because you can't even realize what's right or wrong anymore. Amen. Right. Amen. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yes. It means you got to come to the right conclusion. Even when you see the word work out, it's really like a mathematical terminology. Two plus two equals four. Mm -hmm. And two plus two don't ever equal five. Two plus two don't ever equal three. Two plus two equals four. You're supposed to come to the right conclusion. Look, God gave you his word. God gave you 
his word and he gave you his Holy Spirit living on the inside of you and he will speak to you. Yes. Even when you don't even know the word, he's so gracious, yes. he will speak to you. Amen. He will speak to your heart. Amen. He will reveal right from wrong to you. Amen. But don't tell me that none of every last one of us in this room have played the song. Every last one of us in this room have played the song and said, Oh, but my flesh loves them fat sheep. Oh, my flesh loves to parade Agag around and for everybody to see what a wonderful king I am. I don't want to let it go. It feels so good. The Bible says that Abraham didn't want to let go of the child of the flesh, Ishmael. He said it was grievous unto him. Sometimes it hurts to let, for the flesh to let go of what the flesh is in love with. But the reality of it is, is, is that if you won't work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, you're going to have to let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. You're going to have to be willing to obey the voice of the Lord. But look at this in verse 13. Because I'm talking about obedience. I want to make this clear. Verse 13 of Philippians 2 it says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The point that I was trying to make with that is, you ain't just going to wake up tomorrow morning and say, I'm going to be obedient to God. And that it's going to be persistent. You understand? You might, you might do okay for about three or four days mm -hmm. in your willpower. Mm -hmm. But if Agag doesn't die, listen to me, willpower ain't don't kill Agag. Mm -mm. Willpower is flesh. Yes. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that, and I'm about to get into that in a second, I'm not trying to say that there's not times that you do everything that you possibly can do to separate yourself from it, but the reality of it is, is that it's the work of the Holy Spirit yes. that, look at that, what does it say? It is God which worketh in you. Amen. He's Amen. doing the work. Yes. Both to will. He changes the desires of your heart. Yes. Amen. Whenever you come to the place where you're seeing in the word of God that God's word is speaking to you about specific areas of your life and you know that he is, guess what? The next step to do is to say, Lord, change those desires of my heart that are contrary to you. Well, I can't promise you it's going to happen tomorrow because listen to me. I don't know when Agag really dies in your life, but listen, as soon as he kills one Agag, there'll be another one that he'll show you. Yes. They got plenty of Agags in our life. Yes. He says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He changes the desires of your heart. He changes your will towards his will. And he's the one that also gives you the strength and the power that you need in order to walk right with God. And the way that he did that was when you put your faith in Christ, keep your faith in Christ, then guess what happens? You remain clothed with the righteousness of Christ and now you have access to the grace of the Holy Spirit that is working in you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that's doing the work. It's not you doing all the right stuff, keeping all the right meetings, go and do this, go and do that, coming to church three times a week, reading more Bible, praying more, doing this, joining another ministry. All of that, if you're doing it with the right motives of your heart, praise God, we're moving the kingdom forward, but none of that equals righteousness in the eyes of God. The only righteous thing that has ever walked upon the face of this earth is Jesus. Let me say this. The only thing that's ever died on this earth righteous is Jesus. Hallelujah. And he offered his righteousness as a sacrifice so that you now could be a partaker and receive the righteousness of him. Amen. So that he can change the will of the desires of your heart and do the work on the inside of you. Amen. Alright. Number three. If you want Agag to die, then you're going to have to let the spirit kill Agag because the flesh never will. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 32 through 33 says, Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately, and Agag said, Surely... The bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. So what the Saul will never kill, believe me, the spirit is willing to chop it up into pieces. Because once again, God knows the beginning from the end. And he knows the detriment that these things in our life will cause to our walk with him. So my last question that I have before we close is, how do we let the spirit kill Agag? Well, I've already really preached it. 
But I preach the same thing every week. So let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 13. <laughs> In verse 13, it says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. I like that word, mortify. You know what a mortician is, right? A mortician is somebody that deals with dead people. To mortify, it means to bring to death the, the, the things of the body, the things of the flesh. There's things in our flesh that want to stay alive. And the way that death ensues in these things in our life is, once again, through the Spirit. It's a real simple concept. That, but if we continue to live through the flesh. Now, there's a whole lot of different things that we can say about the flesh. But, you know, to make it simple enough, once again, it's those, it can be two different concepts. Number one, the things in our life. The things in our life that our flesh demands to hold on to. Whatever they may be. Sometimes it's our attitudes. You understand what I'm getting at? You do me wrong. You speak to me in a way that I don't like to be spoken to. Guess what, buddy? You're about to get poked in the eye. You're about to get your foot stepped on. Or you're about to get told about yourself. I'm about to let you know something. Because guess what? I, I don't want to die in that area. I, I, I don't want to listen to me. It requires humility yeah, to let yes. somebody Am I saying that you need to go around letting people beat you up? That's not what I'm trying to get at. There's a right way and a wrong way to respond to situations in the midst of our life. Do, do, can we all agree on that? Yes. But the reality of it is, is if you're a person that's had a problem with wanting to confront every situation like I am, then guess what? For all of your flesh will fight against that. You will want to win. You, you understand what I'm getting at? Whenever you come against me, you're like, oh yeah, buddy, you're going to come against me? Well, guess what? I'm coming right back at you. Well, that's one aspect of the flesh. It could it be something else, you know? It's like I, I have a, a, a thought of what a relationship should be. I have to have this relationship. I'm not going to be complete unless I get what it is that I want. And so what do I do? I go about actively seeking out to make this relationship happen instead of waiting on the Lord. And what ends up happening in that situation is, is my flesh. My flesh Try to produce something and hold on to something. So these are the things in our life. Or there's things that I like to do that even though I feel like the Lord told me not to do anymore, but I still want to do it. The Lord, listen, when the Lord first, when I first got saved, the Lord spoke to me very clearly in the first week of my life and said, for you, my son, drinking is a sin. You're not to touch it again. Guess what? I'm not going to sit here and go on and on about all the stories. But, but the biggest time that I was justifying my actions in my life was after I had become a nurse practitioner. And now I was sitting down at the table with doctors at conferences with, you know, important doctors from New Orleans. And I remember the scripture, a little wine for your belly. It's not a bad thing. And so the next thing you know, I take a little sip, a little sip of wine, a little cup, glass of wine. Next thing you know, I'm drinking two glasses of wine. Next thing you know, I'm drinking three glasses of wine. And it doesn't take long for me to tell you the story. I'm just telling you the Holy Spirit spoke very clearly to me. See, grace is for grown-ups. Yes. And the reality of it is, is that the truth be told, is that the reason that God doesn't really want us drinking, okay, as New Testament Christians, and especially in this area right here, is that drinking is associated with the party atmosphere. You do what you want with that. Yes. And, and the reality of it is, is that God has called us into a life of separation. I'm not the Holy Spirit to tell you what you're to do in your personal life and what you're not. But I'm here to tell you right now that when God speaks to you, it's very easy for you in your flesh to say, no, I'm going to continue to do this. But guess what? He has a way of dealing with us if we desire to truly be his children. So th those are just some of the things. I'm just trying to be real clear on what the flesh looks like. Because Romans 8 says if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. So if you continue to live and let your flesh drive you in the direction that you're going to go, ultimately it will result in death and destruction in the midst of your life. Right. Now, not only that, though, the flesh also attempts to gain victory on its own. And I've already experienced some of that. The, the flesh will try to gain victory another way. Uh, and it will try, once again, the flesh tries to say that by me reading more. Have you ever, you ever, you ever heard that before? Like back whenever you first got saved. Don't tell me that you never heard this because you know you have. If you've been in the church for any length of time. You go to the preacher and what do you say? 
Preacher, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with lust. I'm struggling with stuff. I mean, if you're honest enough to come to another preacher and to tell them that, you're like really having a desire to, to get free, right? I mean, to some extent, anyway. I'm not saying that there's not a portion of your flesh that wants to hold on to it, but you're like, man, this isn't right. The Lord's dealing with me. And so what do they say? Well, you just need to read more. You need to read more of the scripture. Or, you know, oh, you need to get these scriptures. Casting down every vain imagination and every high thing that dissolves itself above the knowledge of God. You need to quote that every time. You need to rebuke the devil. When the devil comes, you rebuke him. And you rebuke him hard and you say it loud. You know, and you're going to scare the devil off or whatever the case. Or you need to make sure that you come, you need to become a church. Well, I will tell you this, that that is a problem. A lot of times people just don't come to church because they don't care about the things of God. But, but it's not you coming to church. And what I'm trying to say is, is this, is that when you change the object of your faith, I'm just trying to be clear. You know, some of you didn't know this already. Just bear with me. When you change the object of your faith, you understand that faith has to have an object upon which it rests. When you change the object of your faith from God's eternal plan, what is God's eternal plan? Jesus, Jesus his righteousness, crucified on the cross for your sin and for my sin. God's plan, how we respond to that? Through faith. Through faith in his accomplished work. When that happens, what happens? God gives us his righteousness and clothes us with it. Now that we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we have access to grace. That's Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 3. We have access to grace. Grace changes us. What, what do we say that the definition of grace is? Divine influence on the heart. A divine influence on the heart, a godly influence on the heart with its reflection in life. It's more than just forgiveness. See, back used to say greasy grace. People say, oh, something about greasy. He, he messed up again. This, that, grace isn't Britney Spears' song that she come up with, however many, oops, I did it again, and so now I just get a little forgiveness. No, that's not what grace is. Grace is God moving in you, operating in you, performing a miraculous work in you, Amen. giving you the strength that you need in order to do the will of the Father Instead of the will of your flesh. But the way that he does that is through you keeping your eyes and faith focused on what God has provided, which is his eternal son dying on the cross. I don't know how much more clear I can make it. Lord, I can't do it, but I trust that you did it. And now God responds through giving grace. But whereas we change the object of our faith through from what he did to what we do. I got to go to church more. I got to pray more. I got to speak in tongues more. I got to do this more. No, you got to continue to keep your faith focused in the right object and trust God that he's going to do the work on the inside of your life. Amen. Yeah. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20. All the way through chapter 3, verse 6. I mean, this is just another place. The word mortify was used in this passage of Scripture, too. And I felt like it kind of explained, the, you know, this, this, the whole story of God in some sense. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. So really and truly what the rudiments means, it means the first things or elementary principles. In other words, the, in this context, it's talking about the first teachings. And so the Colossians had all kind of teachings that were messed up. And part of it was is that they, were, they had been told by some Jewish teachers about mixtures of the law. And so they were mixing the law with all kind of pagan heresy. And it was just a big old jungle mess. And the Apostle Paul was coming against the object of their faith. That's what he was talking about. It says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ, how did you die with Christ? How, how did you die with Jesus? Through faith, Right? When you put faith in Christ, in God's mind, the old man that you were, born of Adam, died with him, was buried with him, and a new man has been resurrected with him. If, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the elementary or first teachings of the world, why is though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? And he's talking about man-made ordinances, rules that man makes. Don't be sudden. If you hear this preacher right here preaching to you some man-made rules that he came up with, then you need to get up and you need to get out. You need to find you another church. It says, why are you subject to ordinances? And he explains them. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are perished with the using. 
after the commandments and doctrines of men. He's not talking about the things that we know are sin. They were still trying to believe in the first teachings like don't eat pork and like that was going to make them more holy. That's not the case. Pork might be bad for your body. I'm not saying it's, it may not be the most healthy thing for you to eat, but it ain't, it ain't going to be a, 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 a grievous sin because you're not following the law in that sense because that's not what righteousness is. Jesus is. And it says, which are all perished with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility. In other words, I don't eat pork. Well, to somebody that doesn't know any better, man, you look holy now. <laughs> I mean, you're so holy. You, you, you don't eat pork and you wear like a little prayer thing on your head when you pray, man, you are just holy, dude. I wish I could be that holy. It looks good to the, to the, to the ear that doesn't know any better, right? But to, the, but to the heart that's been trained by the word of God, man, dude. I mean, like, I don't mean to be rude, but you think that you're of arrived or some level of righteousness because you put some kind of prayer shawl on your head and you don't need pork? No. Jesus has, is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is righteousness. Yes. Amen. And it goes on to say right here. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, put to death, therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say... The wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. He's talking about all the things in this earth of the flesh that draw us away <clears throat> from the things of God. He's saying you need to put them to death. Mm -hmm. And so he's speaking to our flesh this morning. We got to let Agag die because there's certain things that our flesh really likes. Yes, and it stands between us and the Lord. It stands between us and our walk with God and us being able to move forward <coughs> with the things of God. If you could go to Esther chapter 3 verse 10, we're going to close. One of the things <clears throat> that I've definitely said in the midst of this message is that God, um, God knows the beginning from the end. Amen? He has foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen in your life. He knows what's going to happen every day until the end of your life. And when you hear that small, still voice that says, keep your hand out the cookie jar... He's doing it to protect you. Yes. yes. He, because he knows that if you don't allow Agag to die today, Agag's going to cause problems later on Amen. in your life. Amen. Amen. Now, I've got to be honest with you because I'm a preacher that wants to always tell the truth. Some scholars and commentators are divided on really what this means in this particular passage. It says, And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. Scholars are divided whether or not this Haman was really a descendant of King Agag or not. Um, you know, some people say that he was. Some people say that he wasn't. I can tell you that ultimately my whole message doesn't rest on this uh, because everything that I'm about to tell you is absolutely true. And, but what I will tell you is this, it would not surprise me one bit. And the reason that they say that they don't think that this guy was a descendant of Agag was because he was an Amal Agag was an Amalekite, which wasn't from Persia. And now this guy's in the midst of Persia. But the reality of it is, is guess what? The Jewish people weren't from Persia either. And they were there. Esther wasn't from Persia. And she was there. And, and this king, these kings had conquered these other lands and had brought people from foreign lands back into their provinces. And so, and we've seen where some of the Jews were elevated and some of the, so my point is, is that none of that really means a whole lot. I, but what I do believe is that that's important is that I, I, I just personally believe that this, that this is saying that Haman was a descendant of Agag. And, and I will tell you this, that it was the Amalekites ultimately that killed Saul on the battlefield. So he did not kill all the Amalekites that he was supposed to. And what it says right here is that this Agagite was the Jews' enemy. The Amalekites were always the Jews' enemy. They fought, they, they came against them from behind in Exodus 17. He continued to cause trouble that when God wanted him to die and Saul refused to let him die, ended up killing Saul. And it would not surprise me one bit <laughs> if Haman himself was also an Agagite coming back. And you know the story. We just caught on Esther the other night, if y'all were here on Wednesday night. 
And the story of Esther was this, is that Haman wanted to kill all of the Jewish people. He wanted to get orders in writing from the king to have all of the Jewish seed destroyed. And all I'm saying is this, is that the principle I'm trying to make with this is this. God has foreknowledge and omniscience. He knows the beginning from the end. Yes, exactly. When he begins to speak to us, there's times in our life where he's going to desire that spiritual strongholds be broken in our life. And he's going to want Agag to die. And in order for Agag to die, then guess what? We're going to have to want what he wants. Amen. We're going to have to obey his voice. And we're going to have to let the spirit That's right.